Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are beginning a new series for December. The series is entitled The Long Wait. This is the time of year traditionally uh, known as the Advent season. Uh, Advent just means the arrival or the coming or the presence. And it's a time when traditionally there's been this preparation waiting period for Christmas to come, but also uh, deeper than that, it's a, a kind of preparation, a waiting period for the coming of Christ. And we're going to see as we go through this series that there was really a very long waiting period before the birth of the Lord Jesus. It really was the long wait. And that's our subject as we go through these weeks, God willing, up to Christmas Day, the long wait. The subject tonight, the title tonight is The Promise. And we're going to reach back right to the very dawn of human history, the very beginning of our human story. And we're going to discover that right at the beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning of history, there is a wonderful promise made about the Savior who would be born. We're going right back to the book of Genesis. Genesis simply means the beginning. And as we go to the beginning of the book of Genesis, we discover that Adam and Eve have been created. They've been placed in the Garden of Eden. It's a wonderful place. And they've been told that they can eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden except one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're forbidden to eat that fruit. And when we come to Genesis chapter 3, this is probably the darkest chapter in the whole Bible. It is the story of what we call the fall. And it begins with Satan in the guise of a serpent uh, tempting Eve and uh, beguiling, the Bible says, Eve, so that she yields to temptation and she takes the forbidden fruit, she tastes it, and she brings it to her husband. She gives it to Adam, and Adam deliberately takes the fruit, and he eats the forbidden fruit. Immediately, their eyes are opened, and they realize that something dreadful has happened. They feel a sense of shame. They're now afraid of God. They realize that they're naked, and they try to cover themselves. They hear God's voice as he comes to visit them in the garden, and they are terrified, and they hide from God. They try to hide from God behind the trees of the garden. It really is a dreadful, dark chapter, and it tells us that they cannot hide from God, and God uh, brings them face to face with the consequences of their actions. They've crossed a boundary line. They've crossed a red line. They have committed a sin. Uh, they've disobeyed God. And the Bible tells us that by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. And so the entire human race now is plunged into a catastrophe because of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of Adam and Eve, the sin that they committed. And we discover that when God confronts Adam and Eve, the blame game begins. And so Adam says, well, it wasn't really me. It was, it was the woman you gave me. And then when the Lord turns to the woman, the woman says, well, it was the serpent who fooled me and cheated me and, and beguiled me. And, and, and so I ate. And so everyone's blaming everyone else. But God addresses the three parties, he addresses Adam, he addresses the woman, and he addresses Satan in the form of the serpent. And that's what we're going to read about in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Lord is speaking to the serpent. He's really speaking to Satan. And this is what he says. I will put enmity, I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Amen. Now, this is a wonderful statement. We have to look at this in some detail, because in this sentence, in this verse, there is contained the first gleam of hope 
in the darkness of sin that has come crashing into the world through Adam and Eve's actions. And so this is the first mention, the first hint that there is a coming deliverer who's going to reverse all the damage that sin has done. We need to look at this closely. There is a hope here, and mankind is going to cling to this hope throughout the coming centuries until God fulfills the promise he makes. I'm going to think about this in, in three ways. I want to think about three things that are contained in this wonderful promise right at the beginning of time. The first thing is this, that the coming Savior, the coming Deliverer, will be the seed of the woman. Secondly, that this coming Savior will crush Satan's head. And thirdly, he will be bruised himself in the process. So let's think about these things, because this is vitally important. Here is really where it all begins. In fact, uh, the theologians talk about this as a kind of pre-evangelism. This is the first mention that there is going to be a Savior, that there is going to be a deliverer from sin, from the disaster, the catastrophe that is just broken on humanity, there is going to be a coming Savior. And first of all, God promises this. He will be the seed of the woman. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't seem to be very important. I don't really know what that means. Dear friends, that is one of the most important statements in the Bible. It simply means this, that the coming Savior, God says, who will reverse all this, who will deliver mankind, who will bring salvation, he will not have a natural father. He will be the seed of the woman. Now, this is very important because in the Bible, when this expression is used, the seed of or uh, the descendant of, it always refers to the man. So we discover the Bible talks about Abraham's seed. It talks about Jacob's seed. It talks about David's seed. It's talking about their descendants, those who come from them. But on this occasion only, God talks about the woman's seed. In other words, when this deliverer, when the Savior comes, there will be no human father. He will not have a human father. He will not have a natural father. He will have a human mother. He will have a natural mother, and he will be the seed of the woman. Well, it's interesting. If you continue reading Genesis, in the next, the very next chapter, Eve gives birth to a son, and she thinks that God has fulfilled his promise, and she calls him Cain, and Cain means acquired somebody that I've been given. And she thinks, this is the promise that God made, this seed of the woman. This, this son has come from me, and he is the answer to God's promise. Well, she very quickly, I suspect, discovered that Cain was a sinner, just like every other child that would be born. And the sinful nature that Adam and Eve now had has been transferred, has been transmitted, and she is disappointed to discover that this is not the man. This is not the seed of the woman. And the long wait begins throughout the centuries. This hope is kept burning. This lamp is kept burning that one day there will be a child born who will have no natural father, who will be the seed of the woman, who will be born of a virgin, and he will be the deliverer. But the centuries pass, and the millennia pass, and it seems, has God forgotten this wonderful promise? Until one day, the angel Gabriel in heaven is told to go to a smelly, dirty, disreputable town called Nazareth and tell a young teenage girl that she's going to have a child, and this child will have no human father, and she will conceive, this child will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And what is happening, dear friends, when we think of that first Christmas so long ago, it is the fulfillment of this earliest promise. Here is 
the seed of the woman, the deliverer, the savior who is coming, not through the male line descended from Adam, but he is born of a virgin. It's the wonderful fulfillment. God keeps his promises. And when we think of Christmas, when we think of the coming of the Savior, we realize that here is the fulfillment. He is the seed of the woman. But not only that, God says, when this deliverer comes, he will crush your head. He's talking to Satan. He says, he will crush your head. He will bring about your doom. Your days will be numbered. Your kingdom will be doomed when he comes, because he will bring deliverance to the human race. He will bring salvation, and he will do it by crushing the head of the serpent, the head of Satan. Dear friends, that's wonderful. John, when he's writing about the Lord Jesus, he says this, that he was manifested, he appeared to undo the works of the devil. Another writer writing to the Hebrew Christians says that he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Dear friends, isn't it wonderful to think that the Savior who came into the world came with this purpose of releasing mankind, of freeing mankind from the tyranny of sin and evil. And he did it by crushing the head of the great arch enemy of mankind, Satan himself. How did he do it? Well, he did it. You remember the temptation in the wilderness when the Lord Jesus was tempted by Satan? And Satan thought that the Lord Jesus would succumb to, to commit some sin and, and, and would bow down and worship him. And he defeated the Lord Jesus, defeated Satan. He came up out of the wilderness and he had defeated Satan's temptations. Well, you remember when the Lord Jesus died on the cross to his followers, it seemed like a tragedy. It seemed like a great defeat. And yet the Bible tells us it was the greatest victory. It was a victory over Satan. We, we don't understand really what happened there on the cross, but we understand this, that by dying on the cross, the Lord Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers, these evil forces, and he has defeated the enemy. He did it by his resurrection when he rose from the dead. Satan would have been delighted to see Jesus in the tomb, but when the Lord Jesus rose from the grave, he was defeating Satan's power. And when he ascended up into heaven and was received up into glory, the Lord Jesus was defeating. He was crushing Satan's head. And dear friends, the final crushing of Satan's head is going to happen when he comes back again. And the Bible tells us that that old serpent, the devil, is going to be finally defeated and banished and dispelled from God's creation. And it's all because of a promise that was made. The seed of the woman is going to crush Satan's head. But then thirdly and finally, there's another element of this promise, because uh, God says that this deliverer, he will not only be born of a woman, born of a virgin, he will not only crush Satan's head, but he will be bruised in the process. And this is the secret. This is the, the story behind Calvary, behind the sufferings of the Lord Jesus, that in order to save us, he must suffer. In order to deliver us, he must be bruised. And his sufferings on the cross and his death on the cross were uh, part of this great work that was being carried out to deliver mankind, to provide salvation. And in order for sinful men and women to be released from the power of sin. And instead of them now facing, spending, and sharing the judgment of Satan in hell, they are now able to look forward to sharing the glory of Christ in heaven. How is that possible? It's because he was willing to suffer and to bleed and to die and to pay the price for our salvation. This is a wonderful promise. And here it is right at the beginning. We can hardly turn the first couple of pages of our Bible. And there it is. God has stamped it on the page that there is going to be a deliverer. There's going to be a savior. There's a gleam of hope that people will cling to for millennia until eventually the Lord Jesus comes. He is the seed of the woman. He is going to crush Satan's head and he is going to suffer so that mankind can be forgiven 
and can be saved. Dear friends, this is a wonderful promise. This is a wonderful promise. And the wonderful thing is you can make it yours. You can make the Savior yours. You can turn to this Savior tonight. You can believe in him. You can accept him. You can get all the benefit of what he did in his coming and his work if you simply turn to him and realize that, yes, I'm a sinner and I deserve the judgment of God, but the Lord Jesus has come, the great deliverer, the great savior, and he's died on the cross. He's paid the price for my sins. He's risen from the dead, and I'm going to trust him. I'm going to believe in him. I'm going to accept him as my savior. And if you do that, dear friends, the promise will be coming true in your life, the great promise that God made so long ago at the very dawn of history. And the promise has been fulfilled. The Savior has come. Charles Wesley was a great hymn writer, and he wrote an Advent hymn on this very theme. And this is what he says. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Relieve us. Let us find our rest in thee. Dear friends, the wonder of Christmas, the wonder of this season is this. He has come. The Deliverer has come. He has crushed Satan's head. He suffered on the cross so that we might be saved. And if we simply turn to him, we'll discover the true meaning of Christmas and all the wrong that has been done and all the evil that has been in our lives as a result of the fall, as a result of sin, will all be reversed. And instead of dreading the judgment of God and dreading the presence of God, we can look forward to the glory of God and spending eternity with God in heaven, all because the promise that God made was fulfilled. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for this wonderful promise given to man at the very beginning of history. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus, his coming the wonder of his birth, the reason why he came, his triumph at the cross, his sufferings, so that we might be saved. And we pray that somebody listening to this tonight may realize that this was for me, that he did it for me, and that they may simply turn to him and believe on the Lord Jesus. We pray for thy blessing in his name. Amen.